Welcome to Tea Talks Unfiltered, the podcast where we drink tea, we talk, and they're both unfiltered. My name is Jake, and I will be your host. And on today's episode, we're going to be drinking the last of my black tea. And we're going to be discussing learning Kung Fu in China. So welcome back to the third episode of Tea Talks. These first few episodes, I've just been introducing the channel, myself, and the journey to Wudang. And now in this episode, I want to introduce uh, the actual practices. So we're going to be going through the daily practice, the daily routine, the schedule, um, the long-term program that I participated in from 2010 to 2014, the health class, traditional class, and what that practice um, meant to me and has has come to mean to me as well. Uh, so kind of the evolution of it over the years. Um, and throughout it, I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of some stories and some of my personal experiences. So I hope that you can enjoy and join me. Cheers. Hmm. I really should start saying uh, gambei because in Chinese that literally means to dry your cup and it's the, the traditional way of saying cheers. But as long as you're comfortable and enjoying a cup of something warm, hopefully, uh, because winter is in full swing. Uh, so hopefully you're uh, keeping comfortable. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so I want to pick up the story right where we left off. Uh, I had just arrived finally in Wudang and I arrived on a really good day because I arrived on the weekend. <laughs> so I had some rest and then I began. Our training here begins on Fridays. We train until Wednesday. So then we have Thursday as the rest day. So it's a little bit of a different schedule right from the beginning. Um, but it, it's a really nice setup. Okay. So I want to go through the daily practice because regardless of if you're a short-term student in the health class or the traditional class, you're staying for a month or a year or life, uh, the daily practice is very structured and everyone participates in the same schedule. Okay, The curriculum within that practice might be different and there could be a slight different focus or intensity for different groups, uh, but that's something that we'll get into as we go through this episode. So. Starting off, uh, I want to introduce each system, and I'm going to include a brief explanation, uh, introduction to each one, uh, but I don't expect to fully encapsulate the meaning of each practice in today's episode. That is the content for the entire Tea Talk series, so we're going to come back and we're going to revisit specific practices and go deep into specific principles about each one because they are lifelong practices. They do take a lot to understand them in their entire context. But I hope that with this episode, you can at least be introduced to each one uh, if you are already practicing. So that'll give you kind of a, uh, an overview once again. So we get started um, on Fridays and we have full days of schedule. One of the reasons I chose the school, if you remember from the last episode, was because of the immersion. So the way every day is focused around training full time. Um, I know that the way I learn, it's a lot more beneficial if I have that time, that consistency to really dig into a practice, um, especially something completely new to me. I knew it was going to take time, but I knew having that, uh, that discipline, having that environment is really beneficial. And so that's, that's one of the great things about a martial arts school. You know, you're surrounded by it. Everyone's joining for the same purpose. And so there's a really uh, good sense of community right from the very beginning. So that keeps you really motivated because we have long days. Uh, the days can, if you collect all the training, just the training time together, you have anywhere from like seven, eight hours at least, um, nine depending on who's leading class. Uh, but it's very intensive and that is just inside class training time. That's not including the, the study time that you might do on your own or extra practice or, you know, other things that you might do just to keep uh, improving, right? So let's go through the daily schedule to start off with. Early morning, we wake up, we have a Qigong class in the morning, which Qigong, if you're not familiar with the terminology, um, you could loosely translate that to energy work. And so that, that, that covers a lot of 
uh, static and trend and movement postures coordinated with breathing, uh, lots of conditioning. So low postures with flexibility, or maybe some kind of uh, sensitivity building if you're talking about like standing meditation. So there's kind of a variety of things that we would do in the morning, but the principle of what we're practicing in the morning is soft system. So we call these all uh, nagong. So we have these like internal practices. Okay. So everything is kind of to build sensitivity on the body to correct posture, alignment, uh, condition, flexibility. Uh, these kind of principles are like the superficial layer, the introduction to Qigong, but it's just like a really good way uh, to begin the day. I, I used to say, I still say uh, that it's better than a cup of coffee, uh, waking up and practicing Qigong in the morning. Uh, we would do that. And normally if you're in the traditional class, we also have like a morning run followed by a good stretch and then an hour session of Qigong. So total, you're looking at like an hour and a half. Uh, we would usually start about 5.30. Uh, in the winter, everything kind of gets pushed a little bit later uh, because the mornings are so cold. But optimum conditions, majority of the time, 5.30 to 7 is kind of the training area. And, you know, we'll go over our individual practices or our group practices at that time. So Mostly, most all the classes have a leader. Uh, the daily classes are all conducted by the coaches and the disciples of Master Yen. Um, Master Yen oversees the classes and comes to teach specific times. Uh, during our program, he led a lot more directly. Um, but a majority of the time, we also have a coach who is kind of going over the 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 repetitions and keeping the discipline, keeping the schedule, uh, keeping all the framework together. Right. So if so we might come and like teach us moves, teach us forms, uh, expound on philosophy and, and discipline us and things like this. Uh, but then when it comes time to just repeat and drill, uh, we normally have a, a coach to lead that part uh, to keep us disciplined and motivated. So uh, we would do our Qigong class early morning. Um, and hopefully that's pretty clear. Uh, sometimes a really oversimplified way of looking at a Qigong practice is uh, people will call Taoist yoga, which is really, really oversimplified and not really uh, fair or does any justice to what Qigong really is. But it gives you, from an outside perspective, an easy idea. Um, you know, specific postures coordinated with breath work is kind of the first step. So that's what we would do in the morning. Then we have our breakfast. Then after breakfast, uh, we have our first of the two main classes of the day, uh, usually one in the morning and one in the afternoon. In the summer, that might be morning and evening, just because the afternoon can be really hot. Uh, one of the things about the schedule and training over the years is in, in Taoism, we say Tao Fa Ren, which means we follow the way, we follow nature. <laughs> and so you do have to take that into consideration because all of these classes are done in an outside environment. And so that means you really have to kind of roll with it throughout the year and you have to learn how to adjust, which I think is a really important aspect of training that we'll get into in further detail later. Um, but just knowing that we, we are flexible throughout the year. So it's, we're drilling, we're having kind of similar routines every day, uh, but we do try to add variety and mix it up. So we have a system and not just a practice. Okay. So main class two times a day. The first half we have, the classes are each divided into two pieces. First half focuses on basic training. Uh, so that could be anything from morning class. Typically will be stances, uh, maybe shadow boxing. It could be conditioning, coordination drills, uh, warm ups, lots of warm ups, stretching could be partner stretching, uh, lots of different things to practice there. The afternoon, we usually focus more on kicks, uh, jumps, uh, a lot of kicks actually <laughs> like majority of the time we'll focus on the Wudang 1836 kicks and that you can tell like every day in Wudang is leg day. Uh, there is no rest day for your legs. Uh, we're really working on, you know, wide and low postures, dynamic movements, very, very large and low frame overall. So there's a big focus on flexibility, a lot of hamstring stretching, um, overall just a lot of conditioning there takes place but we also will have time for uh, sparring and things like this if you're in the traditional class uh, quite a lot of variety quite a lot to cover if you're staying long term then the second half of each of those classes will be focused more on form 
practice. So regardless if you're an individual training or if you're, you're in a class where you're doing a group practice, um, that part of class will focus on uh, the different forms. So you could have empty hand from basic to advanced, um, things like dragon fist and tiger fist, um, as well as some of the specialty forms. We have things like shingi, baji, and bagua, which shape intention fist, if you're not familiar, is shingi. Uh, baji is the eight extremities. So it's a lot of uh, elbow strikes and body checks. And bagua is the circle walking. So that's the eight trigrams palm, uh, a little bit softer of a system. So there's some specialty forms as well as weapons. So you have short weapons like sword and fan, and you also have long weapons like staff, spear, shovel, uh, things like this. So there's, there's quite a big variety of forms to be practicing on. And that second half of each class, uh, after you're warmed up, you've gone through a lot of basics, then we start drilling the forms. When you think about form practice, what I want you to think about is it's really just connected basics, right? So it's it's all the stuff that you've learned, and now you're applying it to a, to a system of movement. Um, but each one of those practices is isolated. Uh, we spend a lot of time drilling individual movements, so we'll learn a new move and drill it hundreds of times, and then we'll put it together with the form, and then we'll drill that some more. Uh, so there's lots of repetition uh, and just kind of trying to apply that good framework that you establish in the basics to a variety of movement and kind of advancing that through the different systems, through the different practices. You could also be focusing on uh, Tai Chi form. So more of a internal practice, a soft, uh, smooth movement. But once again, we also put a big emphasis in our system in Wudang and Sanfeng Pai on the low postures and very wide frame. Uh, so even the Taiji, like uh, practicing Taiji 108, for, for example, I'm sorry, uh, can be a very, very long form. And if you practice it pretty slow, it can take 30 to 45 minutes. And if you're doing that in hot weather, you will sweat. <laughs> um, so even the soft forms, there is an aspect of external training where it can be... Uh, intense if not rigorous like you're not going to maybe not lose your breath and you're not doing these powerful strikes uh, but there is an aspect of, of conditioning that still takes place um, but taiji can also be a focus for rehabilitation it can also be a focus for a soft practice as well so there might be a little bit difference in approach from student to student uh, just because the practices are meant to evolve with you and so there's something that you should be able to do throughout your life is the goal longevity. So you have your two main classes, big uh, curriculum within those two classes. Normally the morning class will be three, three, around three hours and the afternoon around two, two and a half hours. And so, you know, you have at least five, six hours right there of dedicated uh, Kung Fu practice, Wushu practice, uh, system practice, depending on what you're focusing on. Then we have one more class after dinner in the evening, and that will be our meditation class. Meditation class, uh, pretty much all the way through the year, is around an hour of actual uh, seated time. Might be a little bit around that for discussion or stretching. Um, that class also varies depending on, like, for us, for example, the traditional classes will also uh, sprinkle in culture classes. Uh, we would do lecture series with Sifu, or we would do chanting. So we would learn like the Taoist chanting uh, from the temples, and we'd do singing. Um, yeah, and just like a variety of things. Now we have other practices like calligraphy and music as well. Uh, and that's kind of an individual interest. So if that's something people are interested in, or if you're in the traditional class, there's less of a choice. <laughs> it's it's do the optional practice or continue to train for another hour and a half. So most people pick music <laughs> or calligraphy because uh, that gives you a little bit of a rest time. But that gives you also a really uh, comprehensive approach to practice. You know, we have external forms. So we have that hard dynamic training. We have internal forms. We have that soft kind of rehabilitative moving meditation people will simplify it to be and then we have our full meditation as well as some kind of art you know so you have that balance so that is the the daily schedule um 
varies a little bit between time throughout the year, but overall you're looking at about eight hours of actual training time in the arts. So that's an introduction to the day. Um, we're going to get into each one of those practices as we move along. But if anything of that is very interesting to you and you do want to get started, I have another channel uh, called Wu Dong Wei on YouTube. And uh, there's a lot of practice videos and tutorials on the basics. And I'm going to I'm beginning to upload today is uh, Monday. So in two days, every Wednesday, there will be a new video on the martial arts channel. So there'll be different videos to watch on forms, uh, different tutorials coming up as well. So if that's something you're interested in diving in a little bit deeper than just a discussion, there's a whole channel of content there that I hope that uh, you can subscribe and enjoy. All right. So now you're familiar with the school, the, the daily practice. So let's jump back in. So um, when I first arrived at the school, I joined what was called the health class. My original goal was to come and be part of that traditional class. But remember, the traditional class started at the end of 2009. And I came in the middle of 2010. So I came um, like six, six, eight months late. Um, and I wasn't able to save up and prepare myself quick enough to join in the fall. And so I came a little late, but when I arrived, I joined the health class, which is kind of for all the individual students who arrive at the school. Um, one of the main differences between the traditional class and the health class, we'll, we'll talk about more, but one of the main differences is that traditional class is a group that starts and trains and finishes together, right? Uh, health class, the easiest way to establish that idea is you're an individual. So you've come maybe with a few people even, but you've come predominantly on your own schedule. And so the, the training has to kind of fit that time. And for that reason, uh, it's a more individual approach. So you have the idea of health, you have this uh, improvement class, that's, you know, kind of uh, catering to individual needs. There's still a group training practice there that follows that traditional way. But there's in the second half of class, everyone separates into their individual, uh, uh, getting assigned a certain coach and going through whatever practice uh, suits you or interests you at the time. So I joined the health class, um, but I had a talk with Sifu and, and the coaches, and I, I said I wanted to originally join the traditional class, and since I'm not able to, I, at least I want to emulate it. I want to, I want to follow the same path. So I'm a complete beginner. So let's start from the beginning, basically. And so I was in the health class and I started off learning your basic fist form, Taiji 28, uh, the, the, the long fist set, uh, just kind of going through everything to get set up to get a good foundation. And that was very, very intense. In my preparation uh, coming to Wudang, I mentioned that I, I sent a massive amount of messages and, and questions and probably just annoyed everybody that I got in touch with, but that's the nature of who I am. And I was given a piece of advice by uh, a Kung Fu brother now, Simon, I believe it was at the time. And uh, I asked him, what can I do to prepare? Because I have no experience. And this is obviously a big endeavor once I get there and what can I do? Uh, is there any practice advice? And he gave me a really good piece of advice, which I, I think really is true and still applies. And he said, there's nothing you can do to prepare. <laughs> um, he said, you know, doing some stamina, you know, running, basic stretches, basic fitness stuff. Yeah, start there. That's a good thing to, to have um, because it'll prepare you a little bit. But the way we train, the, the specific movement, the approach, the system, and just the day-to-day -day grind of it, there's no way to prepare for that. Like everyone is going to come into it and, and you know, it's going to beat them up. So he said, you can't really prepare entirely for it, um, but more along the lines of just, just get the discipline set up, you know, get that, that motivation of, you know, every day going out and practicing, uh, because that's going to be the main thing in the beginning. But there is a thing if you're 
uh, a fitness professional, or you're familiar with the terminology called delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, DOMS. And that is a very familiar thing when you're training legs every day or once a week, even for a lot of people. So there is kind of this, there's this barrier to training that you have to kind of push through in the first two weeks, pretty much, uh, as you're adjusting to the training, uh, because there's no rest time, or if there is rest time, it's not really enough. Uh, you're not doing like, it's not like a bodybuilding type set where you're doing arms this day, legs this day, back this day, core this day, and then cycling through. It's really just, you're doing legs today. And then you're going to do punches at the same time. Then you're going to do legs again. <laughs> and then you're going to do kicks. Then you're going to stretch. And then you're going to sit down in meditation for an hour with your hips open in like this posture, right? So it's very intense. And the only time I think that you really feel comfortable uh, during those first two weeks is during class. It's not till the class finishes and, you know, you, you close and you're starting to walk back to your room and then all the tension just comes back. <laughs> so there's definitely like this, this, uh, this, this barrier that you have to kind of push through in the early stages. And that does come back depending on how you train. And when you get into a new system of practice, uh, there's definitely a new, there's muscles that you never knew you had that, that start to be sore because it's a new way of movement. And so because martial arts, because the, the movement is so uh, varied and comprehensive, that it's just something that you really can't get in any other practice. Um, you might get pieces of it, but it's just such a such a big range of movement that uh, you're going to be sore. And I was. Uh, regardless of health class or traditional class, you really try to give it your all and, and really uh, put everything into the practice because everyone who comes there, for the most part, has traveled really, really far and they're already committed they're already disciplined before they arrive because we're all coming we're all dedicating time to this uh, kind of crazy thing uh, in today's world and so there is that like i said that bonding with the class but also that everyone brings that mentality to the table of you know we're going to go 110 every day you know we're going to train right to the end of class you know there's there's a really good environment for that and and uh, even on your days where you don't feel super motivated, uh, looking around and seeing other people push themselves, it's hard not to do the same. Uh, you almost feel like you're letting everyone down, especially when we get to the traditional class. So, so health class, individual practice, and I'm following through with uh, the traditional path, uh, as it were, as best as I can. In those early stages, um, I was assigned a coach to oversee my practice. And for those of you who are familiar with the school, I was assigned uh, John Wayne Gao, uh, Coach Gao. And a lot of people will already be clicking what the practice was like during that time, but let me introduce you. Um, because uh, there are other coaches at the school. So at the time, the traditional classes, there was a Arban, which is the second class, and Samban, which is the third class two and three. <laughs> and those are the traditional classes. Basically, it just goes by the graduating class, number one, number two, number three, number four, and so on. And so at the time I joined, there was two traditional classes. One was the Chinese class, which started a little bit earlier, which is called Arban, second class, once again. And the foreigners class that I, I hope to join is called Samban, which means third class. And so those are the two classes. So the graduating class that already went through the curriculum is the first class. Those are the coaches at the time. And of them, one of them that has been with Sifu the longest is Gao. Uh, he, he joined and followed Sifu at a pretty young age. I think he was only like seven or eight. But he's been training that whole time at the school. He's still here now teaching classes. And uh, really, really exceptional really, really excelled. You know, Sifu kind of brought him up in the practice. Uh, so he's done all the crazy, you know, hard qigong stuff, two finger handstands, all the different flexibility, uh, tong zigong, all this stuff he's gone through. And he's kind of like the, the, the star pupil, uh, in his, in his peak during that time. And, uh, but I should say, but the, the one thing is that he hadn't really start 
uh, leading classes or teaching very much because he, out of the first class of disciples, he was the youngest. He is the youngest. And so at that time, he, you know, maybe he wasn't quite ready to start teaching. But I think when the opportunity came of a crazy guy from America who wanted to stay long term uh, and just do whatever you want with him because it's fine. When that happened, there was a quick connection to uh, for, for Sifu to direct Gao to be my teacher. And so I believe uh, while Gao might have taught other people off and on, I do think that I was his first uh, real, real long-term student. And so there was a, there was kind of an exchange of learning there and uh, class was definitely uh, really intense with him because the only thing he knew was how Sifu taught him. So that was how he would teach me. And some of those practices were pretty intense and pretty crazy. Uh, so even though I was in the health class and there was this kind of, uh, not casual, but kind of a more easygoing approach to it because you're catering to a, a, a wider audience of, of practitioners. There was me kind of on the sidelines following Gao and doing all these crazy practices, you know, doing wheelbarrows upstairs and, and running around one footed and, and going jogging in the mountains and all these different things that we would do and, and, uh, staring contests. <laughs> uh, well, a lot of things coming back, but that first six months of my train time was, was really intense. Uh, and there was a lot of motivation in each class uh, just to meet the standard that Gao was kind of putting out for me. And there was, it was kind of a crash course, really. Um, I was in the health class. There was other students who would train with me. So there were times that other people would join the school and they would uh, also be with Gao for a month or you know a couple weeks or something like that. And they would join my practice and learn forms with me. And then they would, you know, probably leave and I would continue along. So I was like this like staple uh, in the classes for quite a while, which was really nice. And that was kind of the, my beginning of practice in the academy. One of the things that happened for me early on, which, which I'm thankful for now, but I, I didn't really understand it at the time was I didn't start training any of the internal, any of the soft system practices until a few months in uh, so in those early morning classes the the qigong classes uh, sifu set the rule for the coaches at the time that that was their time to practice their forms since the nature of the class is much softer much slower in movement easier to kind of understand and follow there'd only be a coach or two leading the classes the other coaches at the time can come off to the side and focus on their own training uh, go over forms, do some basics, uh, whatever they're kind of uh, for working on at the time. And that that was a good thing, a good call by Sifu because the coaches, uh, because they're teaching leading classes all the time and the, the focus is on other people, there's less time for them to concentrate on their own practice. And so they kind of need some time during the day uh, to focus there. And so that was what they would do in the morning. We, the majority of the school would be doing Qigong or soft training and the coaches and some of the traditional class would be going over forms, even in the early morning class. So I started off, uh, following Gao, whatever he did and wherever he went. And I would go and train with the coaches in the early morning, which was always a really uh, funny experience in the beginning because they would be doing, you know, spear form and eight immortal sword and a dragon fist and all these intense kind of specialties that they each had. And then I would go up and I'd have to do my, my Jibintron, my basic fist. And that was kind of the practice was to, you know, go over everything every single day, break it up into pieces so you can really uh, push through each form. Uh, but I'm like stumbling along behind these people who have already been practicing for so many years and already really great at what they do. For me, uh, it was a really good chance to kind of just be around them and really immerse and be like up close and personal with the practice. Um, again, it was all new to me. So I was trying to soak in everything I could and, and really uh, just digest everything. But the days were pretty intense. There's no real, there's no real close second to that experience of how much experience you can jam into one day. <laughs> Um, and how that, that bond with everyone else, uh, kind of keeps you connected and you have no choice 
but to stay together and create that community because you're just around the same people for your entire day. You know, you go from class setting to meals, to rest, to, to play, to your activities you do on your own. Everything is with the same group of people. So it's a very tight knit uh, little group. Uh, so <laughs> I spend my time the first six months kind of going through these basics, uh, learning the system, getting into each practice and, and trying to understand the language. Uh, Gao was also one of the only teachers that at the time uh, spoke a little bit of English. And so besides him, Sifu spoke pretty fluent. Um, but when Sifu's not around, I at least had a coach that could uh, yell at me in English. And so that was nice and uh, helped me connect the dots and start to learn the language. And I think pretty quickly I was able to understand what people wanted of me if I wasn't able to communicate uh, directly back. Um, you're in that kind of setting where every class there's there's a few terms that they always say <laughs> you know if they're always saying lower uh, you pick up on that pretty quickly and uh, you know the second time you understand the yelling uh, yeah so I participate in the health class in my own kind of traditional setting you can say uh, for for the first six months uh, of my training at that time me and um, a good friend of mine we're both considering what it would take to join the traditional class. And we were thinking that at least we could ask Sifu, we could ask for his permission. Is that something that could be possible uh, to join the traditional class? So during those first six months, I was really training. I was really trying to uh, not really collect all the forms. The first couple I took pretty slow. I think it took a month to learn each of the first three or four forms that I did. After that, things started progressing a little bit quicker. Uh, I was starting to understand the, the basic movement. And so learning movements, because I'm, I'm a very visual kind of hands-on learner, I think that that, that that form of teaching really suits me. And that was uh, a really good way to get into the practice. But at a certain point, we had the discussion, I had the discussion with Sifu as well, about how I would really like to join the traditional class. And is that something that's possible? And when I talked to Sifu about this, he took a moment, as Sifu does, and he nodded to himself. And he told me, the traditional class is a much bigger uh, discipline and a much bigger commitment. And if I can maintain my practice that I have now and kind of do the extra work to catch up to what they've learned, because the one thing I can't do is... I, I I can't hold the class back. Once you're in the group setting, whatever they do, I have to participate and I have to really uh, do my best to keep up because they already have some experience before I arrived. And they've been with the, they've been as the group for a little bit longer as well. And I told Sifu, I, I can do that. I can, I can push myself and I can do my best. And uh, he said, if that's the case, then you can start training with them. And when you're ready, you can join uh, completely. And so I participated in the Taiji 108 class uh, with them that my first, well, yeah, my first winter uh, right before the break. And uh, I did all the crazy training, the frog jumps, the, the extended splits practice, the low posture Taiji, uh, all the crazy stuff that we had to do uh, that, 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 uh, that season. And then I went home uh, for the winter break. We always have a little break to renew visa, uh, there's a slow period of the school. Normally they'll take off for Chinese New Year. So the foreigners would take off a little bit sooner for, you know, Christmas and, and the, the, the New Year's. And so I returned home and talked with my family about how I, I really wanted to continue this practice. And this is really my, I, I feel like this is where I was meant to be. And it was just, it was really helping me grow. And there was so much more to experience at the same time. And so I have, uh, really supportive family. And once again, shout out to the family. Uh, but no, uh, they really helped me and really supported me. And I was able to continue my practice uh, and come back and join the traditional class. That's when things really got interesting. So joining the traditional class, uh, I've already mentioned kind of the, not freedom, but, but more of the individual, the individuality of the health class. 
with the traditional class, as Sifu hinted at, that discipline, <laughs> that commitment is much more, uh, much more ingrained and much more clear and apparent. Uh, as you can tell, as soon as I joined the traditional class, something must have clicked in Sifu's mind that the traditional class was bigger <laughs> and something needs to be done about that. And so right around the time that I joined with my friend Brian, uh, we moved over to the traditional class side of the school where everyone was kind of together. You know, you have to create that um, that space for them as well. So that way, when classes are being conducted, it's easier to find people and, and kind of uh, make sure they're following the discipline, lights out, things like that. So we had to move our rooms over to the other building. And at the same time as we were doing that, um, Sifu also put the restriction on everyone that now everyone has to have a roommate. And so everyone has to pair up and have a room together and share your space. Uh, so that was the first cue that this is going to be a different practice. Um, that definitely took some getting used to. Uh, I've never shared a room with anyone before. I shared a room with the my, my friend Brian. And we had, you know, what, one closet and... One No, we did have two desks. We had two desks, one closet, and two beds. And just very simple box room, you know, windows that don't really retain or block any temperature <laughs> at all. Uh, and we share uh, bathroom facilities between basically the whole class, uh, two, two bathrooms. And so right from the beginning, there's like this kind of focus on the group dynamic and the relationship because in that kind of setting... Um, small confines there is no public space during class or i should say sorry there is no private space during class um, especially if you consider sometimes we're doing sparring or we're showing techniques or we're you know we're teaching hands-on these kinds of practices then you go back to your room and there's still not really that much private space um, you're always sharing um, your room you're always sharing that headspace so to say so that was the first hint with what a traditional class is going to be. Um, there is that kind of lack of control over not only your structure within class, but also how you, how you conduct yourself outside of class. And that is a really big emphasis on the traditional side. Uh, there's, there's kind of this aspect of learning that has to take place with your relationships, with your etiquette. Uh, with the way that you respond to conflict, not only in a physical sense, but also in that kind of emotional, mental sense as well. So there's a lot of emphasis on that, which I think is just a byproduct of the training, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Definitely worth mentioning. Um, at that point, I had joined the class, and I was only two forms behind. So I was behind uh, Shingi, uh, and I was behind a sword form, uh, Shemin Jen. So there was still catching up to do. So a lot of times during practice, I was really, at that time, really, really pushing myself uh, to do more than was required of me because I had like a debt, basically, to repay. So I remember we do kick drills. And when you do kicks, uh, we we really emphasize staying in time, being dynamic, being quick. And we would do one line going this way, and then you turn around, you line back up. You know, there's about four people in each line, so one line goes together, you know, over and over. And we would do one line of kicks this way, and then stop. The first line would go, and we repeat, go backwards. And in those windows, when we were just standing in line waiting for our turn, I would do splits, or I would re like review the last movement that I had learned. And so I just really tried to kind of go crazy and just not... Uh, give myself a moment of rest because those are the times that I had to improve. Very hard to motivate yourself after class to go outside and, and continue some splits practice because you're already doing so much of that during the day that I just kind of had to throw it into the training as well and just uh, kind of set myself a bar, set myself a standard that, you know, when this line's over, I'm doing this practice. When that line's over, I'm going to do this split. I'm going to do this stretch, or I'm going to uh, review this question real quickly. And so there was kind of this really, really focused part of my training uh, where it really just all blurred together, and some of it became routine, 
but it really instilled a good foundation in my practice. Um, and a lot of those flexibility things, a lot of that stuff has really stayed with me, um, because of the degree that I trained it at, but also because there was this buildup into that. It wasn't just something that I just did and tried to overexert myself. I did try to structure it in a way that I was, you know, improving with stability, not just overexertion, which is really easy to do in a martial arts setting. One of the really good things to point out about that specific idea is how in a traditional class setting, there's that lack of control and that idea on your daily practice over time instills a certain amount of, how should I say, uh, kind of retaining of energy, <laughs> like a, like you always have to keep a little energy throughout the week and throughout your, the year, because you never know what the day is going to bring. Being in the health class, I really knew that today we're going to do stances, then we're going to do kicks, and then a couple of days later, we're probably going to do something soft. We're going to do some meditation. Uh, then we're going to do some basic stances again. You know, there's going to be kind of a, a set structure that doesn't uh, go crazy out of bounds too often. The traditional class is basically what Sifu says you do. And so you could be doing stances and then maybe basic training doesn't stop. Maybe you just train basics the entire class. Maybe Sifu comes down and drills your kicks over and over and over again until everyone's perfectly in time. Maybe you're going to come downstairs and do frog jumps, or maybe if you're really lucky, you're going to be isolated with another of your friends and have to fight. <laughs> so there, there is this kind of idea that, you know, you're on edge. You don't know what's coming. And because of that, you start to develop this kind of uh, just retaining of energy, just, just being ready, just in case. And that is like kind of a stress point. Uh, over the long time, but it also kind of, it, it gets you into the practice, but always keeps you from overdoing it just in case, because you, you don't want to injure yourself. You don't want to, you don't want to try to have time off because there is no time off, right? Uh, even injuries. Like I remember I injured my, my ribs during practice. Some people would hurt their, like maybe twist their ankle or, or, you know, break a finger or something like that. And there was never like, oh, rest until you feel better. It was come to class. And if you can't do the practice that we're focusing on, you can do a version of it or you can, you can do something different. Uh, but there's so much to practice that there's no real excuse to not come. You know, I, I injured my ribs and I couldn't really lift my arm up above my shoulder. I couldn't really run or do any like really dynamic stuff with my left side. But I could come and do Tai Chi practice. I could come and do stretches. I could come and do these kinds of things all the time. So there was no rest. It was just uh, maybe a small detour for a short time, right? Even if you're sick, headache, fever, you can do something. You can move, get the blood moving. It'll help you. So that aspect of training uh, really keeps you on edge uh, with just the physical practice of it. There are times when Sifu would really dig into, like we would have a year where we did hard Qigong. So we focused on, uh, hard Qigong is basically beating yourself with sticks. Sorry, mom. And, and, uh, condition the body with bamboo sticks, sandbags, um, eventually sticks. And there's specialty forms of that. If you've ever seen the people like bending spears with their neck, some of that we didn't get into, um, that's kind of a specialty and that depends on the individual, but the overall like iron shirt practice where you do a lot of beating in this conditioning of the skin, muscle, bone, an organ you're building that sensitivity but you're also building that kind of that kind of uh that kind of resisted power right once we went through that training and that conditioning the window of opportunity for sparring uh really grew <laughs> exponentially and i remember there was summers where we would just go out every afternoon and we would do instead of meditation we would we would punch canvas bags uh and to condition the fist and we would kick trees kick pads, we'd run up the mountain barefoot, um, and then we'd spar all the time uh, for, for, a, for a very uh, significant part of practice. I remember that was kind of like the routine. Uh, it was almost like guaranteed a couple times a week. 
to where you, you know, for me being the tallest of the class and, and, uh, not the biggest, but just, you know, being taller and kind of a bigger reach than everyone, I kind of knew who I was up against most times. And, uh, you know, you, you improve a lot, but it's, but there's also this kind of sense of dread that, that accompanies each day. Uh, every time you see Sifu, everyone's kind of looking over their shoulder, like, what are we going to do? Uh, what's, what's in plan? <laughs> and, uh, because whatever you do, you have to commit. If it's sparring, there's no time. There's no set, you know, amount that you're going to be doing. It's until Sifu's satisfied, until you've kind of done something, you've improved something, or we've taken something out and we're drilling it, you know, we could just be practicing falls for two hours where you're just falling down and hitting the ground. Just learning how to do that and how to, you know, be comfortable, be confident and prepared so that when we actually go to do the lessons, you can understand them and improve. That's a really big part of traditional, you know, you have to spend the time to get the discipline get the emotions off to the side, you know, kind of forget that anxiety. When you practice and perform weekly uh, as a requirement, that anxiety, that kind of pressure, those kinds of things, of course, I'm not going to say they go away, but you, you learn to adapt to them a lot better and you learn to kind of overcome them in these settings. And so that is a big aspect of traditional, you know, you, you, you follow, you know, health class, you act and you motivate and you inspire, but in traditional class, you follow. So that is kind of the, the summary of what we did. So throughout the years, I continue to practice, uh, continue to go through the different systems, learning into the advanced forms, um, going over everything that the class did as a group. At a certain point, I felt definitely more established and caught up, uh, not to say, but I do, I do think that, you know, I really did my best to bring, to, to get up to the, to the classes level, um, because my experience was nothing before I came and there was even catch up to do after I had gotten there. So there's quite a lot of work, but I think that that was kind of the spirit of tradition, um, that I had all my older Kung Fu brothers and sisters and they inspired me and pushed me and, and helped also bring me up, you know? So there was this, there was this communication and, and relationship and bond that was built between uh, strangers that became friends and family. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, five years of practice, we, we finished in 2014. And at this point, the question that I get asked quite a lot as well is um, what changed? What did training do for you or, or do to your life or change about you? And for me, the, the obvious answer is always has to do with physical practice. Of course, this is like the easiest thing to point to, you know, before coming here, I mentioned my lifestyle while I was active, it, there wasn't a big focus on these kinds of conditioning, like flexibility and things like that. And so reaching and like touching my toes and doing a full squat to the ground. And, and of course splits practice, this kind of dynamic movement was never something I thought that I could do <laughs> even. Um, so there's definitely a big improvement there. Um, but that's kind of the most obvious of the practices. Like, of course, if you're doing these physical practices for that amount of time, something's got to get through, you know, you've got to learn something. Um, and so I hope that I've, I've done a good job of kind of internalizing those principles, uh, correcting my posture, becoming more stable and how I go about learning the system of movement with the experience we have. There's, there's 30 some odd forms and there's quite a lot of systems of training and then just the constant drill and kind of polishing of each one of those practices helps you to understand the body helps you to understand the mechanics, uh, the coordination involved. And also if you see a practice that's new, you can understand the steps it takes to get there because you've really gone through a lot of them. You've really had that experience, that school of hard knocks, if you will. And so, so that is definitely like a, a very big, uh, you know, not just character building, but really that, 
that that physical practice side is is you know there's something to be said there that can't really be replicated elsewhere and even now when after i returned and i would talk to other people looking back when i say at that time i trained five years uh, even now saying 10 years to some people especially in the martial arts community or in a lot of even fitness communities that's not a really long amount of time right five years is is actually kind of an introductory period for a lot of practices um you know, it's just when you're starting to get the feeling and you're starting to get the, the real good discipline. And after that, now we can, we can really dig into each practice and start to understand it comprehensively. So the one thing that people really don't understand about that experience until you explain it is the, the intensity and the, the amount of practice that you go through. And I think that even not just to say that, yeah, we practice eight hours every day and that time in volume adds up very quickly, but also the back-to-back -back nature of it allows you to get really deep into the practice because not only do I practice this many hours, whatever, in a week, if you want to quantify it, but I'm also my second and third day, I have to practice through the first day before I get there. So it's like you're also dealing with the muscle soreness, the fatigue. You're also dealing with that, that, that level of motivation that gets dropped and building that back up throughout the week. So there's like a lot more of the dynamic aspects to that practice rather than just saying this many hours uh, equals that much time. You know, there's, there's also that aspect of the training, I think, to, to consider, you know, on your second weekend when you're walking sideways up the stairs because it's going to take you an extra 10 minutes to get to your room. You really have to start to think about, I need to wake up and do some stretches. I need to do this. I need to add this practice. I need to be more aware of my practice here so I don't overdo it. And you really have to challenge yourself and overcome a lot of barriers that you not to say that you're not going to encounter in a different setting, but just that you're guaranteed to encounter in the practice that we do. And so I think that's a really important distinction. And once you understand that, a lot of the obvious changes, I think, are pretty clear. You know, you're going to improve physically. Uh, hopefully, if you survive, you've, you've improved mentally and emotionally as well. Um, that is kind of the test of time. Five years is a long time to commit to anything. Um, and definitely there are periods of time that, you know, you, you think about giving up. And I've come to find that over the years, the hardest part about training has nothing to do with the training. Um, there's often the, the peripheral, uh, the things you have to do to accomplish it. Uh, because the practice itself is, while it's very challenging, it's also very rewarding. So what you put into it you do get back and there is that sense of, you know, completion and closure in each class. You know, you find something, you, you, you correct it, you know, you, you get a new practice, you improve it, you know, you, you learn a thing and you set a goal and you do it. And that is like a closed circuit. When you get into the amount of time that you dedicate to that and the years and the things you have to do with relationships and within society to maintain that, there becomes a lot more pressure that is less controllable. I think a reason why some people like really want to isolate in the temple or in the school is because it's so simple. You know, life is so simple. Um, the days blur into each other, but each day can be completed. You know, each goal can be met. And because of that, you're, you're going to, you're going to grow and experience a lot in that, in that small environment. So when you say that, you know, do you ever think about giving up? Of course, of course, uh, maybe every day, but that's kind of the, the, how would you say the challenge of each day? It's not necessarily like a negative outlook. It's just, it's a natural way of thinking you know, and that, that push past anyone who does a physical practice, that push past, uh, to, to gain that confidence, to gain that, 
that that accomplishment is really great and there's no real substitute for that kind of adrenaline junkie chase <laughs> um so yeah um i gotta wrap up the story um there is one last question that a lot of people ask and i've looked back at my training time and i still reflect over it to this day and that is you know what has changed um if we're not talking just physically once again and i think when i graduated i said something that i think now is still very relevant and what i thought back then is i'm finishing this program i'm finishing this this five years training and graduating and i know that as i look back on this time that different parts of it will continue to mean different things to me you know i'll look back and reflect over that training and at this point it'll be a trial but next year it'll be an opportunity and the year after that it'll be nostalgic and the year after that it'll be where i learned all my lessons and the year after that it'll be where actually i missed a lot of lessons uh, but eventually i figured them out and I do think that there's this concept in Taoism that you have to eat bitter. You know, eat bitter basically means um, you're going to kind of go through the medicinal aspect of whatever the experience is so that you can, you know, taste sweet later. You know, it's all about learning that contrast between dark and light. You know, in the in the in the Tao Te Ching, once again, we talk about how um, because we recognize ugly, we create beauty, and vice versa. And so, there's kind of this this idea of our experience doesn't really perfect something, but it allows you to understand the contrast, and it brings that contrast to your awareness. And so, I think that that's a really important lesson in any practice and especially in my experience is that there was this time of eating bitter for a very long time but that allowed me to see a lot of great potential and everything else and so i don't really think anything changed but i do think that everything was brought to my attention and once that awareness was kind of built and once that contrast was recognized, I think then is, uh, is when the work really began. So, five-year program, I think that was the foundation um, for the rest of what I want to accomplish. And uh, that always sounds like a, a funny thing to say even now, that this long period of time, this dedication to a practice... Uh, to immerse into the culture and the, the training, that thing that I completed was actually not the goal. That was the, the first step. And uh, I, I, hope that, I hope that that idea um, is shared with you and whatever journey that you're on. And I hope that you, know, you can think about it as not this goal, but more like a mile marker more like a, uh, a, a, a sign that you're, you're heading in the right direction. Because I think that as we have new conflict, as we have new experience and new trial, I think that that is just digested, over, you know, overcome, and, and it becomes just an experience. It becomes you know, something that you build from. It's the handheld. It's the handhold to the next plateau. So... With that, I hope that uh, we can continue to climb the mountain together and uh, share some more of these stories. Now you have an introduction to the training, the lifestyle, the program that I participated in, and uh, I hope that you're able to join in some part for that training as well uh, and keeping these ideas in mind. So with that, here's the Finding Balance.
one cup at a time. Thank you for tuning into today's episode. Subscribe and join me every Tuesday for new episode releases, also available wherever you get your podcasts. Support the Ways of Wudang through Patreon and get access to resources, classes, and more. Keep the conversation going with hashtag Tea Talk Unfiltered or connect with me directly by joining the Ways of Wudang on Discord. Links are in the description. I'll talk with you next time for another cup of tea.